This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check, so if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. Please type in a Y. There we go. Good to go loud and clear. Just want to thank everybody very much for your time in advance. We are sitting here at just about 25 hours in front of the next FOMC rate cut. Uh, scheduled for tomorrow, 2 p.m., FOMC rate decision for the month of September. A cut has long been expected here to the point where I think it's fairly well baked into current price action. The bigger question, of course, what else is on the plate? Um, the Fed's projections are going to be of extreme importance here, as we have not yet received updated projections since June. Of course, in July, we saw the Fed cut rates for the first time in a decade, first time since the financial collapse. Still haven't gotten updated projections since then. Um, so there's a lot to talk about today, a lot to discuss. I'm going to go over a series of setups that I have on the U.S. dollar. But as usual, this webinar is all about you, ladies and gentlemen. So questions you have, pairs you want to take a look at, feel free to fire those my way. I'll do my absolute best to answer those when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. I need to show you a risk disclaimer real quickly. I'm going to leave that up for about 15 seconds, and then we move right onto the charts. All right, let's make this happen. Okay, so I want to start off with USD here because that's been a really difficult market to gauge of recent. Now, we came into September with a full head of steam, USD punching up to a fresh two-year high. Now, again, that was in a very, very odd backdrop. This is when um, – this was right ahead of U.S. Labor Day, U.S. Labor Day in the early portion of September. And so it was almost as if it was a bull trap. When this breakout showed up, prices pushed to that fresh two-year high, and then we pretty quickly snapped right back. Uh, a couple of different iterations of support showing off the zone that runs between 97.86 and 97.94. Another retest of resistance, 98.75. So, I mean, the net of September price action thus far after that big run fell flat, very choppy. Very non-directional. And I think what we're seeing here is, in essence, markets waiting on the Fed. Not even necessarily for a 25 basis point cut tomorrow, but more pressing, are we going to see the FOMC take a more concerted stance towards dovish policy in the future? Are we going to see the bank pose tomorrow's rate cut as anything more than another mid-cycle adjustment, as we saw in the month of July? Now, that July rate decision, I think, is pretty key and pretty telling at least for traders, going into that announcement. In July, again, the Fed cut rates for the first time in a decade, the first time since the financial collapse. This was the net response. You could see that getting priced in right around that FOMC rate decision. Two o'clock, July 31st, Fed cuts rates. The dollar rallies up to a fresh high, continued to rally, and didn't start to fall back to earth until we got into August trade. Of course, there was a couple of other themes that were taking over at the time, key of which trade wars, which appear to have receded behind the headlines for now. Similar type of motive showed up towards the end of last month, thereby leading to that, what I called a bull trap scenario. Strong topside run, the dollar perches up to fresh two-year highs, even holds there through the Labor Day holiday, but it's as soon as U.S. traders get back on their desks on September the 4th, this move gets priced out and then some. The entirety of that late August ramp got taken out. Since then, we've been very, very range-bound, very, very choppy. Now, with that said, I do think there are a couple of pockets where either dollar weakness or dollar strength could soon become attractive again. Uh, one of those areas that I do not see one of those pockets in either direction is the euro dollar. This still very much feels like a trap scenario to me, and I think that the case could be made that there's a trap on either side of this equation. Now, last week's ECB rate decision saw the bank come out with an announcement of stimulus. Quick wick of weakness into the euro, but prices soon snapped right back. Now, I think the overriding cause of this move was the fact that with the ECB making such a drastic announcement, the thought is now, hey, the Fed can't stick out that much further as being one of the only banks not harboring a dovish outlook for future policy moves. So that dollar weakness snapped back so much that it erased the entirety of that ECB QE announcement and then some. Resistance finally played in at a very confluent, comfortable area here right around 111.09. 111.09 was the swing low from late April, held the lows again in late May, 
even offered a dose of support here in late July, even a bit of resistance here in mid-August. But that was the kiss of death. That happened on Friday. That 111.09 prior swing low was also confluent with the trend line projection as taken from June and August swing highs. Now, given the recurrent element of support around 110, I think there's a good chance that we see a retest of this 111.09 figure tomorrow. Like I said, it does feel as though it's a bit, there's a bit of a trap on either side of this scenario, though. So if we get back up to 111.09, I'm not going to look at this as an immediate short. I'm instead going to look for prices to drive a little bit beyond that to see if we could get sellers showing shy of this prior swing high in late August around 111.65. I want to try to use that level to clear out some of the short side sentiment in the pair that's likely been using trailed stops or some element of a trailed stop to manage that continued short side position. I want to see that level taken out. And then I want to see sellers return before a retest of 111.65. That could reopen the door for short side swing scenarios. The long side is utterly unattractive to me right now because I would need to get stops below this swing low of 109.85. I'd have to take on more than 80 pips of risk. And uh, frankly, I don't know if I feel so good about looking for 80 pips of upside on a top side move or a continued top side move here. Um, so this is one that I'm likely going to keep on the sidelines for now until it cleans up its act unless i get that one scenario showing where we get a break of 1109 but seller showing inside of 1165 to reopen the door for short side swing scenarios moving on dollar cat i feel a bit better for usd weakness here and this is a pair that i've been following for a little while now um, back in june this was my chosen pony to look for short side usd scenarios and this had a couple of different things going on at the same time. Uh, not only do we have the dollar coming off, we also had the Canadian dollar starting to show some pretty significant rip on the back of stronger than expected Canadian inflation figures. Now that lasted all the way into July, at which point sellers started to shy away from support tests around that 130 psychological level, thereby leading into the build of a falling wedge formation. And that led into a bullish theme that lasted for most of August as prices ran higher and eventually ticked resistance off prior support in this confluent zone of Fibonacci levels that runs between 33.61, 33.85. Now I looked at this for short side scenarios last week, week before, and that reversal started to play out very comfortably last week with prices driving all the way down to my second target that runs between 31.32 and 31.50. Sellers couldn't make much of a push beyond that support zone though. Led to a stern topside bounce. Prices returned to another resistance zone as taken for prior support. This was a support zone that lasted for like three months in dollar cat from mid March into mid June. 3250 to 133 flat was a very key support zone. Now, in this most recent bullish iteration that we saw playing through in August, there were quite a few support inflections. That took place around 3250, but 33 didn't really give much run for resistance. That did, however, happen today. After that support bounce played out from 3132 to 3150, prices ran higher, revisited 3250 to 33, even ticked that fresh high earlier this morning, and prices have started to fall yet again. So for short side USD scenarios, this is likely going to remain heavy on my radar for the near term until something breaks or something breaches. Um, the reversal that we saw earlier in September was textbook, beautiful, and put in a couple hundred pips of really strong run. I think if we see that scenario of US dollar weakness coming back, then a retest of that 130.11 swing low that came into play in mid-July, I don't think that's out of the question. Uh, the way that I want to move forward on this one right now, I want to look for immediate targets around the 132 figure, secondary targets in that same zone, 3132 to 3150, and tertiary targets are going to be a little bit trickier. There's an option to use like that 131 swing that came in in late July, right around that FOMC rate cut. 3065 has a Fibonacci level, although there hasn't been great action here of recent. And then, of course, we've got the big figure down at 130, which feels elusive. But that, that support that played in just north of that may be softened enough to where if we could get down for another retest, we might be able to push into 130. Uh, likely, any targets that I'm going to set are going to be inside of that. I'll 
let go of the extra 22 pips to look for that psychological retest for fear of getting maybe a bit too greedy on top end profit targets here. Uh, another area conducive for dollar weakness, in my eyes at least, is right here in cable. All right, give me a quick second. I have an article to share with you. I published this yesterday. By the way, have you guys seen the new daily effects yet? Pretty snazzy, right? Pretty cool. Um, the part that I like most right up here, we call those the spark lines. And you can see how easily accessible a lot of these major markets are. All right, sales pitch over. Um, this is the one that I'm talking about. It's the article that I published yesterday morning uh, right around the U.S. market open. In this article, I had enclosed a support zone to follow in cable, which soon came into play. There we go. I'm going to put this in the chat box for anybody so interested. There we go. And so there's a bit of a, a story here. Um, on a longer term basis, early August, we saw a very key trend line come into play for the first time since the flash crash. That trend line is taken from the 1985 swing low connected to the October 2016 swing low. If you project that on, you can even see here on the monthly chart, we have the build of a morning star formation. Now this isn't confirmed yet, it's not completed. We need to finish September trade first. But a morning star formation on the monthly chart, especially when supported by a long-term support study, is very attractive to me. So this is going to keep cable on the short side of the dollar, at least for now, until something shifts or until something changes. Now, that argument has only increased in volume over the past couple of weeks. Now, we were talking about this in early August when that trend line first came into play. And that didn't entirely deter sellers. As you can see here on the daily chart, we did get a little bit of drive early August below that trend line, but prices soon came back, a little bit of resistance, and then just a week later, we had this level showing up as support. We had that strong flare of USD strength right off the bat coming into the month of September. And that's what helped to create this downside break and this morning star formation right in here on the daily chart, which has continued to play out. Now that is what I want to see on that monthly chart. I want to see that morning star formation continue to play out, highlighting that bearish reversal off a long-term level of support. Now, I'll be the first to admit the fundamentals here, they're not pretty. I'm not a fan of it. I especially don't like having to wake up every morning to see what happened in the Brexit drama overnight, because there's always something. But from a technical perspective, to my eyes, this is pretty clear reversal potential that could have the possibility of even further continuation. I was even a bit skeptical a couple of weeks ago when I said a 125 retest was soon in the cards, but sure enough, that's where we're at right now. Going down a bit tighter, that bullish construction, it's still there. Uh, as I had written yesterday, and this is even the exact chart that I had used to write it, there was a zone of higher low support potential as taken from the 124 level that provided a good dose of support back here in July connected to this group of swing highs around 123.75. We came down for a revisit there last night, and we've since seen another vigorous bounce, hoping to print another fresh monthly high. So at this stage, this thing's a little too high to buy, a little too far away from that prior point of support. I mean, I'm not going to take on 130 pips of risk ahead of FOMC. And so at this stage, I basically needed to pull back a little bit more, or some, so that I could use that point for stop placement. If I'm gonna use that point for stop placement, even right now I'm looking at 120 pips of risk. It's way too rich for my blood. For 120 of risk, I wanna see at least 120, probably closer to 150 of upside, which basically means I'm gonna need price action to retest this longer term zone of resistance. The one between around 2671, 2721. The zone we were working with quite a bit earlier this year. So like the trade, hate the level, I need this thing to clean up its act a little bit before I can add to the position, get long again. Uh, you can see right now we're trading right within this resistance zone between 125 and 125, 23. If this move weren't so strong, I'd be a lot more open to short side swings, just in essence looking to fade this off of resistance from a fresh high. 
but that trend has been really, really strong. This is the last area that I want to look to buy the U.S. dollar right now. I'm still okay with selling it, uh, selling the dollar against the British pound, looking for continuation here of uh, this topside trend. Now, as for points to look for that pullback to play into, I got to get a little creative because we haven't really seen a lot of price action between 24 and 25 of recent. But there is this swing here around 2440, and I could extend that up to 2450 to color that as a little bit more of a comfortable zone to play for pullback potential. If I could get a pullback to 124.50, at the very least, I could squeeze that stop about 55 pips away. And then I could start to justify the risk outlay with a retest of current levels. So that's a little closer to something I can work with. But again, love the trend, hate the price, need this thing to clean up its act before I can get uh, even more long. All right, let's just do it. Swissy. So this is the area where I've been focusing long USD strategies of recent. The way I see it is this has a lot of the positives of a short side Euro scenario without all of the fear of a continued bear trap. I mean, much like we saw around ECB, ECB through the kitchen sink at the QE matter last week, and it's like nobody cared. The Euro ripped and rallied, right? Well, at the very least, dollar Swiss has remained within trend, taking a step back here, that bullish trend channel. It's been in play now for over a month. Prices are have tiptoed higher, testing above that 99.50 level that I was looking at for target potential. Getting a little bit tighter. This is something I might be able to use for an FOMC reaction. I need to see prices hold above 98.50. That was a swing low from last week, another level that we had looked at for support. But if I could get a pullback here, 99.02 could be workable, 98.75 could be workable. But the key is finding that support ahead of 98.50 that could keep the door open for topside swings. Topside swings can then retarget that 99.50 area of resistance, followed by a retest of that parity figure. That hasn't been in play now for about four months. Love the trend. Don't entirely hate the price. But I could use a little bit more of a pullback before I look to reload and get long here again. All right, moving on. Aussie dollar. So we looked at this zone last week. And between Aussie and Kiwi, I mean, just from a momentum basis, I would probably prefer to sell Kiwi versus Aussie, but the technical setup here is a bit more clean. And, and this is something that I can, that I at least feel I can manage the risk a little bit more proficiently on. Um, but drawing back to the zone that we looked at last week, it's essentially just comprised of these, uh, the expats between the 764 and the 786 Fibonacci retracements from this major move, taking the low from the flash crash earlier this year, drawing that up to the January 31 high. The expansion between the 764 and the 786 did a really good job of catching support here in late May. Helped to turn around another vigorous sell-off in mid-June. And has just now recently started to come back as resistance. But like we talked about last week, this was a zone that was going to need to show its hand. It was going to need to show a proclivity to turn around buyers to help reverse that bullish trend. That bullish trend coming in on the back of um, a cessation around fears of uh, U.S.-China trade war. And we're just now starting to see sellers tiptoe a little bit deeper into the water. Like if you go down to a four hour chart, there you go. You can see where that longer term resistance zone helped to hold. Prices tip down and we've seen prices quickly return back into that zone. So a hold between 68, 62, 68, 75 keeps the door open for short side swing potential. I'm gonna look for stops even above this swing high at 68.95. I'm gonna go all the way above 69.03. Excuse me, that's 69.003. But I want to get it above this zone that had previously offered a bit of support back in late May. Give it another 10 pips of wiggle room. Five to 10 pips of wiggle room. And uh, basically looking for this short side push to continue down to even lower lows, lower highs. Now, a very obvious target zone is right down here. It runs between 6760, 6782. Uh, I'm not going to be so greedy as to where I'm going to look for that as my initial target. An area like 6820 could be comfortable for that initial target because if I'm getting stops at 6905, 40 pips of risk off current set, 68 and a quarter could get me a 1 1, stop to break even, and then I look for the bigger push down to this zone, 6760, 6782. 
Kiwi. Again, the short side momentum here has been a bit more attractive than what we have in Aussie. Aussie has better levels to work with, in my humble opinion. Um, but nonetheless, there is still perhaps some workability in this chart. Workability. I may have just made up a word there, but it's workable at least. Um, similar to Aussie, there is a zone of interest. We're not there right now, but it looks like we're getting closer. Uh, that zone runs between two different Fibonacci levels, it runs between 6372, 6403, both of which have had some decent inflections over the very recent past. Right, we've seen both of those prices come into play one degree or another. Most recently, 63.72 helped to set the swing low um, after the Sunday open. 64.03 had set helped to set support going into the Friday close. And so this gives me a big wide-bodied zone to look to for lower high resistance potential, similar to Aussie. Just need that price to improve a little bit. Uh, similar thesis stops above these swing highs, these swing highs around 64.50. And then I could look for initial targets down around 63 and a quarter or less. I probably want that initial target to be a little bit inside of that swing low. Stop the break even. And then look again for the bigger move to take place down towards the 62 and three quarters. Maybe even some longer term breakdown potential if we do see a really strong dollar coming in on the back of tomorrow's FOMC rate decision, which is a, which is very possible. I don't want to say probable at this point because of what's going on in repo markets. I think if anything, that's going to cause the Fed to be maybe a little bit more cautious with their verbiage tomorrow and summarily dismissing future rate cut potential. There is a scenario that could create a liquidity concern around the U.S. dollar and tighter policy is not going to help that at all. Or even, quote unquote, less loose policy. Okay, moving on, I saved the best or my favorite major setup for right now, at least for last. Dollar yen. So there's a lot of different possible scenarios springing from tomorrow because in essence, we're not even looking for the 25 bit cut. We're looking for what else is going to happen. Right. And then, as just noted, there's some waves or ripples showing within the repo market, which is a key market uh, underneath markets, uh, underneath global markets plumbing. But if we are going to see a continuation or if we are going to see dollar strength, I'm getting a lot more warm to the idea of topside setups in dollar yen. Now, we're at a troubled area above this 108 and a quarter price is similar to what we had looked at last week. There's a big zone right up here that runs between 108.47 and 108.70. So what I want to look at here is I want to look for a topside break of that 108.70 price to first hit 109, which point stops to break even very quickly. And looking for a continued breakout scenario with secondary targets cast between 109.67 to 110 flat. Priority number one, is that stop to break even? And you can even see here on this four hour chart how we have this equalized price action. It looks like it wants to tip over again. I don't like that. I don't like the swing scenario enough to get short, but it is enough to at least caution me from trying to play a pullback here. And instead, reserving this one just for topside breakout potential around that rate decision tomorrow. All right, that's what I have on the majors front. I uh, wanted to look at a couple of commodities markets as well. Gold, is this the pullback? <sighs> I think I've asked that question a few different times over the past five months, and at this point, it's like 0 for 5. <laughs> None of these have been the pullback. But if the Fed isn't as dovish as what markets are looking for tomorrow, if Powell does frame this as another mid-cycle adjustment, I think that pullback scenario could come in really, really quickly. And if we just take a step back on the weekly chart, we basically have that bullish trend stuttering at a very strong key zone between 1527, uh, 1509 and 1527. We still have overbought RSI, although that has come down a bit, but it did show a bit of divergence on shorter time frames, right? RSI still hasn't cleared out. 
So this could be enough to urge a little bit of caution on the bid, especially around tomorrow. Now, if, if we do see the Fed coming out more hawkish than expected, then I think this thing is gonna tilt over and I think it could bring into play quickly a support zone that runs between 1475 and 1480. A little bit deeper is another area of potential around the 1450 level. This was a quick swing high that showed mid-July, helped to hold the highs again in early August, but to date hasn't yet been checked back for support. Moreover, it's not a real obvious level, which makes me like it even more. So if, again, if we do see a strong dollar as a result of tomorrow's FOMC rate decision, which I think is a distinct possibility, and that pullback will play down to about 1475 to 1480 or 1450 and I would still be in the seat looking and ready to buy. Okay and last most certainly not least the most important market to look at ahead of an FOMC rate decision that's the S&P 500. Um, I think it'd be short-sighted to think that the Fed doesn't even consider this I know they're not supposed to but we've also heard multiple times in the past where not only Jerome Powell, but other FOMC uh, members, including Chair Yellen, mentioned the need to keep the expansion going, right? And well, if we're going to look at the expansion, what is the, you know, what is the expansion? What's, what's classifying that? One of the easiest ways is looking at U.S. stocks, especially given the ramp that central bank money buying has, has posed over the last 10 years. Now we've been stuttering up here near the highs as Fed policy has come further into light. But I don't think the Fed is going to try to crash this thing or push it lower. And I think we've had some very recent events like the July rate cut in which the Fed posed that as a mid-cycle adjustment in which stocks sold off. Or again, we could go back to early May. The Fed didn't sound so hawkish, or excuse me, so dovish at that May rate decision. And so stocks sold off for the next month until Jerome Powell all of a sudden got really, really dovish in June. June rate decision saw the Fed finally start to forecast a rate cut. Stocks continued to fly. It wasn't until they actually cut while posing that as a mid-cycle adjustment, then coupled with additional tariffs on China, that stocks started to spill over again. But they've had so many of these scenarios just over the past year. If you remember the Q4 slump that saw prices move down almost 20%, and it was 20% on a, on a future basis intraday. And then again in early May, and then again in early August. I think the Fed's had enough of these to where they're not going to want to step on a tripwire if they can help it. So I think this is motive for the Fed to be dovish tomorrow. Uh, I just don't know how dovish we're going to see them be within the summary economic projections that everybody's going to be following, looking for, waiting on, etc. So tomorrow's a big one because there's a lot of questions. There's very little certainty. And the situation globally has kind of loaded the deck. It's going to be tough for the Fed to remain as one of the only central banks that's not actively looking at loosening policy to some degree. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. Uh, I want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. Don't hesitate to ask me anything trading related. James, can you share your thought on pound yen? Thanks. Yeah, that sterling move, man. That has been beautiful. Uh, hard to believe. And again, this is like a month ago. Even I was a bit skeptical on seeing prices return back to 130, but that thing has just been a rip roaring rally. I think, if anything, this is a good reason as to why to look at uh, variated profit targets, right? Because if I just gave up the whole load at 130, I would have I would have given up a lot of run. Uh, similar to cable, it's tough to buy at fresh highs, you know? Uh, there is a big zone here, <clears throat> 3350, 3376. It showed a little bit of resistance on the way up hasn't shown anything on the way down. I think the luxury of that would necessitate a break of these quick swing lows that came in earlier this morning, or yesterday morning, excuse me, thereby clearing out some of the long positions that have been trailing stops. I think that could be a comfortable little zone to follow for higher low support potential pound yen.
But yeah, I still like that theme. Yin weakness, sterling strength, both things I can still work with at the moment. Just don't like the price. This thing is very, very extended right now. Don't want to end up uh, regretting buying a buying a buying a top. Uh, from Quran B, I'm short dollar cat, still looking for 32 to 31 target. I am. Um, you know, I think if things really pop off tomorrow around the Fed, it could go a lot deeper. But earlier this month, we heard from the BOC. They didn't mention the possibility of prospect of rate cuts at all. So at the very least, you know, kind of like my uh, my view on on dollar Swiss, at least there we have a variable that we can isolate. All right, the Swiss National Bank is dovish. They're going to remain as dovish, maybe even to the degree where they defend uh, franc weakness by intervening in markets. I mean, I don't think that we're going to see um, the Bank of Canada intervene, but they're not actively looking at rate cuts right now. So at the very least, I have some semblance of uniformity in, in, in one of those currencies right now to the point where if we did see a weak dollar, then this is going to remain as one of the more attractive areas in my eyes to look for that weakness to play through. But yeah, 32 would be the first stop. And then below that, the same support zone. I wouldn't want to get too dicey around there. I mean, that kiss off 3132 is so clean that I probably would even look for that secondary profit target about you know, five, ten pips up, you know, so as to not get greedy and get uh, and get higher load out of this trade. Um, from Roland, uh, hello, sorry, came in late. Can we take a look on GBP? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know if there's any other pairs that you wanted to look at, but yeah, happy to dice this up from a from a variety of vantage points. I mean, this is one of those areas where crosses may be a little bit more conducive because, you know, again, we can isolate to a known variable. That known variable right now is sterling strength on the back of some heavily deep oversold conditions that played in early August. And as we started to see that reversal play out, it is something that could possibly bring a bit of attractiveness to cross pairs like pound Kiwi, like pound Aussie. You know, because those themes of weakness in Aussie and Kiwi, they've been pretty profuse. At the very least, I got something that I could isolate to here. Sterling strength in the back of uh, some deep oversold conditions that are previously shown. Uh, Mr. Marcos Rodriguez, hello, hello, James. Always good to be in your webinars. I do miss not having a Thursday webinar sometimes. Where are you at, man? We have Thursday webinars all the time. I mean, most of the time. Sometimes I have to cancel them because I'm out of the office or whatever. But yeah, we have Thursdays as well. Uh, give me a quick second. I will get you that link. Uh, same time. It's uh, it's also at 1 p.m. But I keep it in a link on my desktop using that uh, Microsoft Stickies application. It's a good one. Uh, but I'm going to put this link in the chat box for anybody so interested. All right, there we go. All right, from uh, Javago Javago, uh, on the new page of daily effects at analyst pick, there is no date when the analyst publishes his opinion. Please inform someone at your office, make corrections, and to fix this issue. Thank you. Uh, give me a quick second. I think. No, oh, there it is. Yeah, so. All right, we'll just start from the home page. Okay, so like David Song published an analyst pick last night right here. I right, just under analyst picks. The date and time is right in there. You can see David was up early this morning. I'm just kidding. He's in Australia, so that was regular time for him. But uh, yeah, they still have the date and time on it. It's just not in the same place as it was previously. For Pete, good to see you, buddy. Man, that's a candle on the daily Swissy chart. Let me have a quick gander here, see what we're working with. Yep, yep, it is. It's something I would kind of classify for chop at this point, just because of how many wild wicks we've had on either side of the scenario of recent. Uh, for Pete, awesome look at the majors. That's all I have for now. Steering clear of the yin for now. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because the BOJ is another one of those central banks that at the very least we have like some idea of what they want to do. It's just they've been doing it for so long. There's a question of how much more they might be able to do. So I think in an environment where there is a bit of, I don't even want to use the term certainty, but certainty around what the Fed is looking to do. You know, as in if the Fed comes out tomorrow, squashes the prospect, any future rate cuts, which I don't think they're going to do. But if they did, at the very least, then we could be repositioned to look for dollar strength. And that's something where like that top side of dollar against setup could be really, really attractive. You know, something like that. You know, or maybe against the, uh, you know, against the Swiss franc, right? Although we're talking about weakness, uh, central bank supported weakness in each of those currencies, which create a bit of a quandary, but. Uh, Marcus Rodriguez, hello, James. Thoughts on pound Oz, pound CAD, as always. Thank you. Yes, sir. Pleasure to help. Let me see what I have on either of those right now. don't remember, but I believe that I had checked this and there wasn't much symmetry. Let me just cross-reference it. I'm pretty, I'm pretty picky about my trend lines. That is not a good one. Let me see if I could buckle it up a little bit more. That's a little bit more usable, a little bit more workable. Yeah, I mean, it just looks like it's not ready yet. I'd be real, real trepidatious to trying to buy right here. You know, because there's been a pinch for price to turn around pretty aggressively from like 82 up to like 82.50, 82.65. I'd be real cautious trying to buy it right there. Uh, what could work out really well for me is if this thing could pull back and again test this area for support, maybe even a little bit of, of wick cover underneath, provided we don't pierce through and violate 80.50, because that's what I'd want to use for my stop placement. In essence, looking for a defense of the big figure at 180 flat. Might be something there. Cas is going to be a little bit tougher because I'm looking for strength in both of those currencies. One has been decidedly stronger than the other, but somewhat a quandary. That sterling strength has shot these things up to levels that are going to be real tough to chase. And that's just a nasty daily bar. I don't want anything to do with that. What could clean this up or what I could look for around tomorrow's FOMC rate decision. Uh, we haven't yet filled the gap. That uh, gap is just about, it's about 12 to 15 pips off current price. But basically look for that gap to fill and then look to see if I get a quick pullback down to the support level of the 618 Fibonacci retracement. All right, you see the way that, that helped to catch some resistance. We gapped right right back below that, so I, I wouldn't think that I'm the only one looking at this level. But let that gap first fill, and then look for prices to snap back, and then try to catch some higher low support off of that. And that could be a workable scenario. Ooh, lots of questions about the repo markets. All right. Repo markets, can you explain further? Uh, could you please explain the repo markets? How does it improve monetary easing? Uh, what about all the repo rising saga? Uh, how will the Fed take that into account, if at all? more easing. Yeah, so the Fed's already announced that they're going to come into the repo markets tonight with a big figure, in essence, to try to stem that concern. Uh, repo, what that is, is that's the overnight lending of government securities to meet cash obligations, in essence, to secure positions, right? And there's an interest rate attached to that. Um, probably the best historical primer 
is if you've read the book Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, the second time that Jesse Livermore is making his making his way through exchange-based markets, he talks about the guys in the money pit. The repo market is the money pit, more or less. The folks that you go to to get short-term loans to finance overnight positions. And it's often done in current day with government securities. Uh, that has an interest rate attached to it. That interest rate is going to be governed by supply and demand. If there's liquidity crunch and there's not a lot of dollars to loan, that interest rate is going to go higher. That's exactly what's been happening over the past couple of nights. So when I alluded to the Fed potentially looking at a liquidity issue in the U.S. dollar, that's where it came from. To the point where the Fed now has to step in to the repo market to supply some fresh capital in the effort of keeping the interest rate compressed. Um, as far as monetary easing, it, it, its impact shouldn't be huge because we're talking overnight loans. You know, it's, it's not something like the discount rate. It's not necessarily even linked to prime or anything like that. But it, it highlights a very big issue that could impact monetary easing or monetary concerns, which is uh, a liquidity crunch in what's in essence the plumbing for the global economy of the U.S. dollar. If there's not a lot of those U.S. dollars out there, it's going to be a lot more expensive for overnight loans, which eventually is going to create or could create selling in a variety of assets that are financed by USD trades. Is that clear? If you want any clarification or any more info, just ask. Happy to help as much as I can. Um, as far as the the saga aspect of this, so it's a it's a part where I'm personally torn because I'm I'm a trader, so I'm cynical by nature. I can't help it. I see journalists getting all excited about something. It's hard for me to get excited about it. I instead start trying to look at the other side as to how I could use that to my benefit. Their excitement, their over emotive states, um, you know. And I think over the past couple of years, we've had five or six diff different flares where all the journos were saying, oh, guys, this is what's going to take us all out. You know, remember, if you remember the VIX crunch that we had at the beginning of last year, I think that was probably the best one, uh, volatility-wise at least. You know, so I, it, it, it's, it's really hard to tell how much of this is grandstanding and how much of this is legitimate fear. I mean, because at the end of the day, if the Fed notices the problem right off the bat, reasonably they could offer some element of support to keep it from becoming a problem like it did when Jesse Livermore was going through it, you know, a hundred years ago. But again, it was in reminiscence of a stock operator. Uh, I believe it was like his second trip to Wall Street. So he had his bucket shop run, then goes to Wall Street, fails out, and then it's on his way back into Wall Street where he talks about the money pit, the money brokers. That's the repo market today. Uh, from Andrew Hutton, James, please be kind and comment WTI, thanks. Wow, that's some volatility, right? Um, so I'll be the first to admit to say that I didn't see this coming in either direction or either side. So when this came up yesterday, I, I was kind of, I wasn't on speaking terms with oil. I, I kind of wanted to just let this whole thing play out to try to get an idea for what I might be able to or what I might try to look for next. Um, I think the problem in this, I think, is encapsulated pretty well in the next question. What effect would Saudi attacks have on rate cut possibilities? I mean, that's that's really the kind of the gist of it, you know, is that we're dealing with a potentially global crisis if this scenario does continue to develop, right? Because what, Saudi going to take on Iran head on? No. I mean, they're going to need some help, right? And who's that help going to come from? Well, okay, well, now you have the U.S. against Iran. That's a pretty nasty fight that uh, it's a pretty nasty fight. I'll leave it at that. Um, you know, so now we're talking about a war bid. And that's something that could have like a global market effect, a global market impact. So I really hope that doesn't happen. But I mean, we have to look at it as a distinct possibility if Iran is in fact sending drones into Saudi Arabia to attack their their primary economic interest of, of, of oil extraction. Um, now, that being said, Saudi's already come out saying that they still want to IPO Aramco. So, I mean, that's probably still going to happen. Um, as far as how to play oil prices from here, I'm really stuck personally. This weekly chart is just absolutely nasty. I have it off some good levels. And so when I get a scenario like this, I try to take on the perspective of a sniper. That's all I can do. 
by sniper, what I mean is I look for a level to come into play, look for a short-term chart to indicate a hold of or a test at that level, and then I look to take my shot, the full expectation that if that shot doesn't land, I'm dead afterwards. This isn't a two-shot kind of ordeal because I've given away my position. I got to look for those perfect spots in the chart to try to line this thing up so that I could get it with a tight risk outlay and look for a big move. And the reason for that is because when something becomes more unpredictable, as I'm currently uh, assessing oil as, then my risk reward ratio needs to be even more askew. I need to make those fewer wins make a much bigger mark on my bottom line because my hit rate is probably going to be a lot lower. So as far as near-term levels to work with, there is a level that we're testing right now at 58.75. That was a quick swing high that came into play here in late July. It again helped to, uh, to point out the very, the very top of this evening star formation. And you can see right now where it's coming into play on an intraday basis, helping to or trying to help to hold the lows. I'll show you on a, a shorter term look. Four hour chart, yeah, you can see it right at 5875 or 5879, excuse me. So, quick, quick, short term types of support or resistance inflections that could open the door for swing side possibilities. If this one doesn't hold a little bit lower, I have another level of 5741 and below that at 5657. And then conversely, if price is pushed back, 59.64 is resistance, 60.94 is resistance, maybe even the 60 big figure is resistance. And if we get all the way back to 63.17, I don't know if I'd be questioning continued top side at that point. I, I don't know if I'd want to be looking for a short side swing if we get all the way back up to the very tip top of that move that had helped to hold resistance after this week's open. Big gap to open this week and a big level of resistance did come into play. But, you know, this has most definitely been pushed around by the headlines. That could be a dangerous prospect. Uh, as far as the effect the Saudi attacks will have on rate cut possibilities, you know, I think in general, monetary policy tries to be supportive of fiscal. So if there was another war effort, heaven forbid, um, you know, I, I think that if anything, we would see a softer Fed than, than a tighter or more aggressive Fed on rate hikes or hawkish policy down the road. But, you know, end of the day, they, they could justify it in any direction that they want. You know, and that's kind of been the case since the great financial collapse. And I think that's one of the quandaries that so many people have with them is that there's, you know, such a plethora of data. It really comes down to what you want to pick and choose to justify your case or to justify your cause. I mean, even the rate cut that happened in July, it could be questioned based on inflation data that wasn't really that soft. It was the trend in inflation that they wanted to focus on. Okay, well, if they didn't want to cut rates, they could have easily just said, okay, well, hey, is inflation still close to the target? We're going to wait it out. You know, so it, it it becomes a little bit more difficult to to take on the claim that the Fed is in fact data dependent, because even the even the reading of that data is subjective to a large degree. Uh, from Demetrios, hi James, about retesting 2375, 2395 uh, zone and cable. You mentioned it earlier, but then you uh, would create a lower low even if in the 240 chart when that hint to change in sentiment switching back towards bearish approach. Thanks, Ben. No, I'm not. Well, so first off, this is in the eye of the beholder. All going to be dependent on which time frame you look at. But what I was looking for was just a simple pushback and, in fact, a short-term lower low. Right? Because when I was writing that yesterday, I think we were like 24.50 or something. So I was going to need that swing right there at 24 and a quarter to get broken through, i.e. giving me a lower low to allow that longer term support zone to come into play. So what we have here is just a quandary of relativity, my friend. It depends on the chart frame, chart time frame that you're looking at. And I picked that support zone off of the four hour. And I'll usually do that stuff off the four hour daily or longer. Short term support levels, I don't give as much credence to. Short term is where I want to see confirmation and momentum. Uh, levels, context, that's all four hours or later for me. But lower lows and lower highs, that is in the eye of the beholder, which is often going to be governed by chart time frame. Uh, 
uh, from Raj Puri, any plans to have live sessions during important events like FOMC, et cetera? Yes, sir. Yeah, we have one for FOMC. We, we even have uh, John Kicklider running that session. So it should be pretty good. But if you want to navigate to that, pretty simple. You go here in education, live webinars. That's our full webinar schedule. Notice we have this new snazzy setup. So tomorrow, see right there, John Kicklider, FOMC. Uh, I think that link will take me there. Yep. FOMC, I'm going to put this link in the chat box for anybody that wants to sign up. But that is a very good point, my friend, and uh, one we're trying to address, uh, such as the session that we have with John tomorrow. Uh, from Quran, Euro Yin, please, for sure. Happy to help. Okay, so the falling wedge played. Nice little bullish reversal in there. Nasty gap action this week. So setting this up off a longer term chart is, is going to be a bit of a challenge. We finally filled the gap. I honestly don't know what in the world to do with this thing right now. It's kind of in the middle of no man's or woman's land to my eyes. Let me see if I could pick off another level that I could work with. Yeah, yeah, this thing's kind of gnarly on both sides. So I'll tell you where I really like this. Where I really like this is when we have one of these themes coming back into light, either global risk aversion, which could help with the end strength, or fears around the euro. You know, as we've seen over the past seven years around European politics, economics, etc. Neither of those really seem to be hot pressing concerns at the moment. And we have a real smooth and clean near-term trend here to the upside. And, you know, longer term, that thing was really aggressive on the downside. I, I, so I want to default to short side scenarios here. I just don't have the wherewithal to do it given current context. But kind of like we saw with that dollar CAD setup, these falling wedges that'll form, it doesn't necessarily signal or, or dignify an end of trend as much as it shows that, hey, we're just really oversold for where we're at right now. We need to check back, clear out some of those stops that have been trailing all the way down, reset sentiment, and then there's some fresh folks on the sidelines that could actually go out there, trigger shorts, and push it down. It's just not showing me anything on the side of resistance or for short side swings that yet looks attractive. And, you know, and I talked about this last week with these late Friday moves of a very obvious nature. They just stick out like a sore thumb. I don't know how much I want to believe in those as price movements because we go down and we look at when they take place. Well, FX markets are technically open 24-7, but almost every broker I know of closes at 5 p.m. on Friday. That's at 5.05 on Friday. That's at 5.10 on Friday. That's at 5.15 on Friday. And that's why we had the long wick. That's why we had the long body, rather. Right? But at no point on Friday itself did this thing actually trade above 120. And we had one little wick that touched it. But we didn't trade above 120 until after market had closed or after most brokers had closed. So I don't want to necessarily incorporate those into the overall analysis that I'm using on these things. Uh, from Quran, also, uh, any views, levels to share on oil, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's look at that again real quickly. And uh, you have full access to my chart here. Uh, 58.80, the zone is holding a support right now. A little bit lower, 57.41. Good little resistance hit back here in mid-August. 56.57. 55, 57, 55 maybe even. On the resistance side, just a little bit up, 59, 64, 60, 94, 63, 17. Although that 63, 17 revisit there, I would be questioning the bearish stance and maybe even look for bullish breakout potential at that point. <laughs> Scott Clarkson. Um, I seem to miss your Thursday webinars too. Oh, that's okay. We could, uh, we could fix that up. Give me a quick second, I'll get that link for you. Um, oh, that was John's link. Uh, how's dad life working out so far? Hope all is well. Oh, it's so cool. It's the, 
the greatest job I've ever had. Um, he's just starting to come awake or, you know, either using baby parlance where he's like looking around and he's, you know, trying to taste everything. And, um, it's, it's, it's the greatest gift I could ever imagine. But thank you for asking Scott. I really hope, really, really appreciate that and hope all's well with you as, as well. Um, from Pete, exactly. I'm assuming absolutely nothing from BOJ. I stopped trading in pairs. Got a Swiss franc, which makes me nervous. <laughs> Uh, Sterling is doing what it does. It's own thing, baby. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's markets are never predictable. I know that's kind of a uh, I know I'm not telling you anything because you've been around this game for for a while. Um, but there's a Warren Buffett quote that I always draw to whenever we're in a situation or scenario like we're in right now, which is be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And this is something that I teach a lot of the folks that I teach or that I mentor here at Daily Effects, which is my life is easiest on me when I'm in a drawdown. That's right. When I'm performing my poorest is when my life is most enjoyable. I know it's crazy. It doesn't make sense. It's absolutely illogical. The reason is because losing is not hard. It's not. You know the answer. The answer is you have to get better. You have to improve. You have to fix what's going wrong. My life is very is, 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 is very logical at that point. My problem is very clear what I have to fix. It's when I'm not losing that I start to get a little more stressed out about little things, little minutia, right? Uh, especially when I have an extended gain in a long-term setup or in a long-term market that I then have to manage because now I have profits on the table that I have to protect while also looking for more. And so that's where I try to get, or where I do get more fearful. And that's when newer traders will often get really greedy. And then it's when I'm in a drawdown where it's really easy for me to swing because again, I know what I have to do. I have to improve on what I'm, whatever I'm doing at the time. And to do that, I have to keep swinging even when it doesn't feel right. I even have to take setups that I don't like all that much, but the setups there and the strategy says to take them. Who am I to question my own strategy? And if you don't have enough confidence in the strategy to where you can really rely on that when you are one of those periods of drawdown, then that's, that's where you know you need to work on the strategy so that you can rely on it when you need it. Um, for Scott Clarkson, journalists get paid to talk, though. That's their wage paid. Just talking about repo, et cetera. Keep a clear head. Don't buy news at face value, in my opinion. Yes, sir. LDHF. I could not have said it better myself, my friend. Yeah, I was actually having one of these conversations not too long ago, just a couple hours before the webinar. There's a very clear dichotomy between what I do in a market and what a financial journalist does or – you know, even just like an analyst at one of these financial media outlets, we have very, very, very different roles, very different tasks. You know, my job is to be cynical about these new things until markets have proven them to be a thing. Whereas the journalist's job, the, the, the financial media's job, it is to get excited about these things. You know, like when you have something like Bitcoin come up, well, if they're not capitalizing on that traffic, their competitors are and, you know, and, 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 in, in, the, in the game of competition, in the contest of capitalism, they're going to lose. So they have to do what they do really well, which is sometimes capitalize on these things that make people fearful. Whereas as a trader, it's my job to look at that and evaluate and see whether or not it's BS. And then to make my play. I have respect for both sides. I have respect for both sides. <laughs> Andrew says, they just keep telling us what our charts already do. Exactly. That's that's the beauty of price action. It it filters out the BS because this is this is skin in the game right here. You know. Wow. Okay. So this is um, uh, I'll leave this one is the last comment of the day. Uh, Vinny just dropped a bomb on me here. <laughs> uh, Vinny says, and Trump just tweeted. Uh, Trump says a China trade deal could come soon, maybe before the 2020 election or one day after the election. Wow. So this is kind of what I was referring to a little bit later when I said the powers that be have this thing or want this thing to move in one direction. And I am but 
a simple, humble trader? Who might have questioned that? The President of the United States has his finger on the trigger and he can move markets with a tweet. He just did it again. And I think that's going to continue until something breaks or something shifts or something changes. So as a trader, I have no choice but to just to integrate that into my strategy and to keep going until it goes wrong. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time. I really, really appreciate it. I'll be back on Thursday, so we'll look after the postmortem on FOMC and a lot of these other market themes as they come up. But, again, thank you for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And, as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.